in this lecture on bacterial anatomy, we are going to cover where bacteria house their chromosomes. We're going to talk a little bit about other types of DNA that bacteria have called plasmids and what they're used for. We're also going to talk a little bit about the bacterial ribosome and some other internal or intracellular structures in bacteria like inclusions, uh, storage structures, and cytoskeleton. And then in the next recording, we'll discuss the plasma membrane in bacterial cells as well as some specific types of transport. So we often think about bacterial cells as being prokaryotes, and we know that prokaryotes by definition are cells that do not have nuclei. Um, that means there's no nucleus inside of a bacterial cell, but that doesn't mean that there's no organization of the DNA inside a bacterial cell. What bacteria have rather than a nucleus is a region called a nucleoid, which is the region inside of a bacterial cell where the DNA is contained and organized. Um, the reason we can't call it a nucleus is because technically the DNA is not wrapped within a membrane as it would be in a eukaryotic cell that does have a true nucleus. So bacteria have circular double-stranded DNA as their chromosome. You can actually see bacterial chromosome all leaking out of this bacterial cell here. And what you notice is that there's a lot of DNA in a bacterial cell. And all of that DNA has to fit into this area here. And so there are some things that bacteria do to decrease the size of their um, large circular chromosome and allow it to fit into that smaller nucleoid region. And this process of kind of shrinking the chromosome down is done via supercoiling. And what supercoiling is, is basically taking a big circular piece of DNA and then looping it to form almost this flower structure. And then each one of these individual flower petals is able to twist a little bit more and further coil in on itself to shrink that size down. And so supercoiling compacts the long extended circular chromosome of bacteria into something that's much more manageable inside of that bacterial cell. And one example of how supercoiling can make something smaller that you might know from real life is an old school telephone cord. Old school telephone cords are extremely long. They might even be 10 feet long if you extended them out. But because they have that coiled structure, they're able to shrink back up to maybe being a one foot long. And so that same principle of coiling <coughs> applies to DNA in bacteria. Okay, so in addition to have their one chromosome, um, which has all of their essential genes on it, bacteria can also have small extra chromosomal pieces of DNA. These are pieces that are not part of that one single chromosome um, that might add different genes to different bacteria. Most plasmids are also circular, just like the bacteria's chromosome. And different plasmids, depending on the type you can see over here, might have genes that do different things. Plasmids don't contain a lot of genes. They maybe contain one or two, maybe 10. But one thing about the genes that are contained on plasmids versus on the chromosome is they tend to give the bacteria some kind of an advantage. And so in this case over here, you can see that there are conjugative plasmids. These plasmids have a few genes that allow DNA to be transferred from one bacteria to another. There are some plasmids like metabolic plasmids that carry genes for specific enzymes that can do processes, maybe um, a different metabolic process. There are R plasmids, which can actually help the bacteria by carrying genes for antibiotic resistance. And there are some plasmids that can make bacteria more infective, called virulence plasmids, right? And they can increase the virulence or the harmfulness of a bacteria, which is not good for us, but is good from the bacteria's perspective. And rather than there just being one copy of a plasmid, like there's one copy of the bacteria's chromosome, plasmids can differ in how many there are inside a bacteria. A bacteria might have one plasmid inside it, or it might have hundreds of copies of this R plasmid, for example, inside. 
And so in addition to having DNA, which is localized in a nucleoid region, and then some DNA that's outside the chromosome in plasmids, uh, bacteria also have ribosomes inside of their cell. And ribosomes are essential because they are where proteins get made. Every cell, whether it's a prokaryote or a eukaryote, is going to need proteins. Proteins are for structure, they're for transport, they are enzymes that do work for us, and so bacteria need all those things. They need a place to make those proteins. <laughs> Some of the bacterial ribosomes float free inside the cytoplasm of the cell. Some of them stick themselves to the plasma membrane. But all bacterial ribosomes are made up of two subunits or two pieces, which you can see here in kind of teal and then gray. The large subunit is on the right, and that one's in gray. We generally call the large subunit the 50S subunit. S is just a measurement of density, so this has a density of 50. It's larger in size, and it's made up of two types of rRNA, or ribosomal RNA. The 5S rRNA, which you can see up here, and the 23S rRNA. And then the small subunit on the left in teal, is referred to as the 30S subunit. It's a smaller size or smaller density, and it's made up of 16S ribosomal rRNA, or 16S rRNA. So you've got two subunits or two individual pieces of the ribosome. Each one is um, a little bit different in size. The large subunit is made up of 5S and 23S rRNA, and the small one is made up of 16S rRNA. And we also sometimes think that because bacteria don't have, are prokaryotic and don't have organelles, that they don't have a lot of organization or structure inside. Um, and that's not true. Bacteria do have ways that they can store materials inside. One way that they're able to store materials, whether it's organic or inorganic stuff, um, is in these things called storage inclusions. And so in this image on the top, you can actually see a whole bacterial cell and each one of these white circles is a storage inclusion that's filled with some type of starch molecule. This would be what a storage inclusion looks like at the molecular level on the bottom. Usually storage inclusions are made up of a single layer of lipids and proteins, which is the blue stuff on the outside, wrapped around whatever is stored on the inside. In this case, this is a storage inclusion for PHB, which is a carbohydrate or sugar that the bacteria can use for energy. And there are also another type of kind of storage area in bacteria called a micro compartment. And a micro compartment is almost like an organelle in a eukaryotic cell. Micro compartments don't only contain some kind of molecule like a sugar or starch or a fat, but they also can contain enzymes that can do stuff with those molecules. They have very specific shapes. So you can see that 3D shape down here. This is a polyhedron. You can see some storage inclusions marked with the arrows in this image on the top and storage inclusions here in the image B on the bottom. And micro compartments on the outside <coughs> are completely composed of proteins. So there's a protein shell that wraps around whatever molecule they're storing and the enzymes inside. And then one other interesting kind of inclusion that bacteria can have are um, small vesicles or vacuoles that store gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen. And so in the gas vacuoles or vesicles, you can see here in this bacterial cell, there is carbon dioxide or oxygen gas. And that gas is enclosed in walls made of protein. So these guys have a protein shell as well. And gas is useful for bacteria, especially ones that live in the water, because it can contribute to buoyancy or the ability to float. And so some bacteria that live in the water are photosynthetic, which means they need sunlight to make sugar. And to get sunlight, they've got to kind of float up to the surface of the water. And by they are able to make gas vacuoles, fill up the cell with the gas vacuoles and fill up with gas, 
float to the top, do photosynthesis, and then they're able to sort of pop those gas vacuoles or destroy them to release gas and then sink back down when they're done, which is one kind of cool um, thing that bacteria can do. And then so in addition to the ribosomes, the DNA, uh, the nucleoid region, plasmids, and ribosomes, bacteria <coughs> are also um, highly dynamic on the inside in terms of their cytoskeleton. What cytoskeletons are, are basically, they're very um, supportive structures that can help cells divide, whether it's the division of the chromosome or the physical division of two new cells. They're also able to provide a scaffold or a highway that proteins can travel on and help maintain the bacteria's shape. So we tend to think about our skeleton as very permanent, very rigid, um, and providing just the structure. But a bacterial cytoskeleton does, it is able to provide some support, but it is also able to break down and then remake itself during cell division and break down and remake new roads or um, trafficking pathways for proteins that need to move around the cell. And you can actually see some of those cytoskeletal filaments up here in green. In this image here, the pink are chromosomes and the cytoskeleton is green. You can see it pulling apart those chromosomes during cell division. And then here you can see proteins <laughs> marked in red moving all along a track. And that track is made up of cytoskeleton. And there are different types of cytoskeletal proteins. Um, the first one is called FIT-Z. And FIT-Z has a role in cytokinesis or dividing cells into two. And so you can actually see FIT-Z in green in this picture down here. It localizes to the middle of two dividing cells and basically builds that bridge or allows those two cells to divide Another cytoskeletal protein is MREB or MB1. MB1 gives bacteria their rod cell shape. And if you zoom in in this picture on the right, this green is showing what MREB or MB1 looks like. It actually looks like a coil that wraps right along the inside of the plasma membrane of a bacterial cell and holds that structure, gives a bacteria that shape. Another cytoskeletal protein that can cause shape in bacteria is called CRE-S, which stands for crescent. And this is actually localized here in red in the bacterial cells. And what it does is it provides a curve rod shape for certain bacteria that have this kind of comma shape to them. And then finally, some bacteria um, cytoskeletal proteins are able to help segregate or separate plasmids when the cell divides, move DNA around. Um, this particular plasmid or this particular protein PAR-M is involved in plasmid segregation or making sure that both dividing cells get some plasmid. So you've got some cytoskeletal proteins involved in cytokinesis, like FIT-Z, physically dividing cells. You've got MREB and CRE-S, which are structural cytoskeleton proteins, giving bacteria different shapes. And then you have PAR-M, which helps bacteria divide their DNA, particularly their plasmids, when they divide. 